Uh, we'll give it a minute or two. I want to welcome all of you uh, to uh, the Pitt Family Foundation Speaker Series. Uh, this We're now in our third year of this series. It's been a tremendous addition to the community. Um, likes of Ezra Klein, Eddie Glau, Lawrence Lessig, Janet Napolitano, so many others. Um, and uh, we're just going to get started here in about a minute. Um, and we're really excited about tonight's uh, presenter. So the Pitt Family Foundation Speaker Series is part of the Participatory Democracy uh, Initiative of the University of Arizona College of Law, School of Journalism, and the School of uh, Government and Public Policy. The program was created uh, out of the idea that several years ago that we needed to really focus as a community on the challenges to, democ to democracy and how we can constructively assist in public participation. And I, I'm proud to say we've gotten some of the finest uh, thinkers in the country on that topic here. Uh, tonight, we are so pleased to uh, have with us Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, who is the Carl Loeb Professor of History at um, uh, Harvard. Uh, Professor Gordon Reed has won numerous prizes, including the Pulitzer Prize in History in 2009, the National Book Award in 2008 for uh, the Hemings of Monticello, an American family. Her other works include Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, an American controversy, uh, Vernon Can Read, a memoir that she uh, collaborated with Vernon Jordan on, Race on Trial, Law and Justice in American History, and a volume of essays on Andrew Johnson. Her most recent book is on Juneteenth. Is, is on Juneteenth. Uh, uh, Gordon Reed has received a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Humanities, a MacArthur Fellowship, the National Humanities Medal, the National Book Award, the Frederick Douglass Book Prize, which in the intellectual world is kind of like the uh, uh, accommodation of the Grammys, the Emmys, and the Oscars. Uh, she has really uh, gotten her deserved recognition. In 2011, she was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her most recent book uh, on Juneteenth has made her one of the integral voices to help Juneteenth officially enter our national conversation. Her book is a about the day is powerful, and it's an essential work of history that weaves together America's past with her personal memoir. It was named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, Time Magazine, and NPR. The New York Times cited the work as a, quote, incredibly important historical story that no one has told, but that everyone needs to learn. Uh, she weaves together American history, dramatic family chronicle, and searing episodes of memoir. On Juneteenth provides a historian's view of the country's long road to Juneteenth. Uh, tonight, uh, we are very pleased to have with us uh, Annette Gordon-Reed, who will speak to us about democracy. Take it away. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for that introduction. And I'm very happy to be here to participate in the series on participatory democracy, something that I think about a great deal as a scholar of the early American Republic. Uh, we're living in very interesting times and we have been for the past few years, a very interesting day to be having this kind of discussion. Uh, I'm sure lots of people's minds are on what the historic thing that just happened today, whether however you feel about it, it is a, a something that will be considered a part of American history. But I wanted to talk tonight about something else about events that have taken place in the past couple of years that have had a profound effect upon America and the United States and gives us great pause for thought and consideration. I'm thinking about the reaction to the murder of George Floyd and the effect that that had, the cascading effect that I think it had on American culture. 
I am not, uh, I don't have any empirical uh, evidence to, to back up every single thing that I'm saying, but I'm talking about what I feel, what I observe and think is the truth about that particular moment in May of 2020. I'm sure most of you remember the story and know about the story. This happened in the middle of the pandemic, which I think may have accounted for the kind of shattering effect that it had. I mean, we have seen many videos of people of African descent, African Americans who uh, have been killed by police officers. We've seen the videotapes and the stories about it. And those stories flare up and exist in the public consciousness for a time and then they die away. But the George Floyd events had a particularly profound effect on the country. And it could be because we were in the middle of a pandemic and people were forced to think about one another passing the possibility of passing COVID to other people. We were concerned about public health and there was a huge focus on that in ways that we don't typically do. It could be because we were all indoors being, you know, quarantining and on social media, but his murder had a galvanizing effect upon people. I, I remember being stunned at seeing the throngs of people who came out in cities all over the country, large cities, small cities, every region, every state had some version of a protest from small numbers of people to thousands of people. And not only that, these protests were all over the world, in Paris, London, Rio, in Tokyo, everywhere. People came out and held banners up to the effect that Black Lives Matter. And I was stunned to see that. You know, it actually surprised me that so many people around the world focused in on the murder of this black man. And I couldn't put my finger on it. I couldn't think of why, you know, this had such a profound effect upon people. But, and it was kind of shocking to me in a way. I also think it was shocking to many Americans. I think people looked around and were surprised that so many people, and not just black people, the numbers, these were whites, people of all races actually, who came out and protested about police treatment of, of people of African descent in the United States and others as well. Police brutality in all forms, but people came out and they said black lives matter. That was a phrase that had become anathema in some circles. It had been uh, ridiculed. It had been, I think, derided as racist itself, as if saying Black Lives Matter necessarily meant that white lives didn't matter. That's never what it was supposed to be about. It was saying that Black Lives Matter too, and Black lives were not cheap. That was essentially what that phrase meant. And we had people all over the world coming out to agree with that. It shocked me, and as I said, I think it shocked a number of people in America. And people thought, you know, and I think a lot of whites who were complaining about this, who, who saw this as a hostile move in some sort of way, were surprised to see their neighbors and members of their family and you know, relatives, others, and friends come out and voice this kind of support for African American people. And I really believe, and this is the part that I don't, as I said, I don't have, it is not an empirical, empirically proven thing on my point, but I have a hunch, an instinct that this caused a backlash. Part of what we're seeing now in the attack on schools, in the attack on libraries, the attack on curriculum, all of those kind, curriculum, those kinds of things, comes from this sense that something is amiss in America. If that number of white people took the side of people who were protesting about police brutality, that was part of the reason for the backlash. And there was also the issue of the 1619 Project, 
that centered slavery as part of the founding of the United States of America. And I'm sure we can talk about that later on in the question period, um, how that all fit into it. But those things, I think, caused a backlash. And what we're seeing now is a direct result of that. One group of people who were participating, participating in democracy in the way they thought was necessary during that time, actually coming out to make complaints about police brutality, were met with skepticism by others who felt something has gone wrong here. People are being taught the wrong things. So in my home state of Texas, which I write about in, on, on Juneteenth, which has a very, very long history of sort of avoiding in some ways talking about some of the more unpleasant aspects of Texas history, and I outline them in the book, was at the forefront or has been at the forefront of trying to change what children are taught to try to sort of tamp down on stories that put sort of put you know, what they say would put white people in a bad light, but basically is talking about the things that happened in Texas during the period of slavery and in the uh, the aftermath of slavery and Jim Crow that basically didn't end until the mid 1960s and we're still having issues now about voting rights and so forth, that they were not going to, they didn't want people to talk about this kind of thing because they felt that their children had been had been brainwashed to think things that were different from the way that they were taught, the things that they learned during history. So this, what was supposed to have been a moment of reckoning, which I was very hopeful about with all these people all over the world coming out to say that Black Lives Matter and that we're gonna create a different direction for policing, a different direction in, all, in uh, relations between the races, we have what very often happens in American history is sort of a backlash when there's an assertion of black rights and black progress. And not just when black people are involved in this, when whites are involved in well, they, they end up being, whites who are sympathetic to blacks end up uh, suffering or being the objects of backlash as well. So in Texas and in Florida and other places, the legislation about what you can and cannot teach in school, I think is a direct result of all of this, is there's the culture war where people are trying to limit the conversation about some very, very difficult subjects. And one of the things that I think uh, has happened as a result of this is the media and others have begun to focus a lot on education and I'm sure you have heard the stories about complaints about critical race theory, which is something that I can almost guarantee you is not really being taught in K through 12. Critical race theory is a, is a, is a law school topic and started by people here at my institution, as a matter of fact, had a, were some of the leaders of that, of that movement. Uh, Kim Crenshaw, who was actually my classmate here at Harvard, uh, was one of the leading one of the leading voices creating critical race theory. That backlash against that, that the attacks on critical race theory are all a part of this idea of trying to limit discussions about race and the country's troubled history with race. Now, it's not surprising to me, it should have been surprising to me that that would happen. We've always also always had sort of a, you know, their schizophrenic attitude. There's an American paradox that we talk about a lot when we think of a country that was founded on the ideals of the Declaration of Independence. We take that as our creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Those words that Jefferson wrote, at, even as the country held African-American people as slaves, even as Jefferson himself did, so this duality of duality of American life, high ideals, but with a dispiriting reality have always been there from the very beginning. And the question about 
Black people's role in American democracy was always up in the air. Jefferson and members of his generation, the founding generation, even, even past the founding generation, up to Lincoln, had an idea that many of them, that slavery was wrong, slaves should be emancipated, but at the same time, after that's over, they were supposed to be expatriated. There was no notion that we the people, or this is what he wrote, there's no notion that we the people included African-Americans. African-Americans were unjustly brought here and that if they wanted to realize their fullest potential, they should be somewhere else in their own country. That was Jefferson's view, Madison's view, John Marshall's view, the view of the people who founded the country. Now, I have to pull back a bit and say they said those kinds of things, but in their private lives, they did things that indicated that they didn't think that was true for the people in their lives. They get to stay where they were in Virginia, but not and not go to Africa. But thinking about it in terms of, of policy and what should happen, that sense of concern or belief that Black people could never really fit into the American democracy has been here from the very beginning. And a lot of what we have been doing over the years is trying to find some way to say that that's true or not true, to find some way of, of working this out. And once we had the Civil War and once the Reconstruction Amendments came into place, the, the, the post-Civil War uh, amendments to the Constitution came into place, the country started down the road to say that Black people are in fact citizens. But because there was a war about this and one region of the country was defeated, and never, and many of those people never really caught into the idea, I should use, shouldn't use that term, but actually, actually accepted the idea that Black people were going to be citizens. We've been battling this issue from, from now on. And so it shouldn't have surprised me in the post-George Floyd world where you saw whites of goodwill joining with Blacks, that that would create a a, a, a backlash among some number of the population. The other thing that happened to me when I you know, was thinking about George Floyd and the aftermath of, uh, aftermath of his killing and the people who came out of the streets and voiced their opposition to what had happened and their concern about what has happened, it was in that period of time that I decided to write my book on Juneteenth, uh, a memoir, a short memoir, it's a short book. And while I was there in New York under quarantine with Manhattan, as I'm sure you may remember, where Manhattan was ground zero for the pandemic, I, like other people, many other people, began to think about how we had arrived at a point that something like this could happen. And the other thing I noticed, in addition to the sort of the thousands of people who came out to protest George Floyd's uh, murder, was an intense interest in the institution of slavery. I noticed that searches on social media about Juneteenth shot up a lot. People were interested in this, and not just people in Texas, people all over the country were interested in slavery, the institution of slavery, and the end of slavery in Texas. And I think it was because as people thought about George Floyd, they had to figure out, people thought about how did we get to this place? How did we get to a place where Black lives were in fact devalued? And people saw it as a legacy of slavery. And thinking about Juneteenth was a way to educate themselves about it. So I wanted to write a book that talked about the end of slavery in Texas, what it meant, and the fight for equal rights for Black people from the time, June 19, 1865, when Gordon Granger goes to Galveston, Texas, and says that slavery is over in Texas. 
He issues general order number three, and he says something in the order that he really didn't have to say. In addition to saying slavery was over in Texas, he said now the former slaves would occupy a state of absolute equality with other people. So he's saying black people, unlike the people who the founding generation who were kind of concerned about whether or not this could happen, he says, Granger says, that they would be in a state of absolute equality. And I think that was important because he is referencing the American Declaration of Independence, which suggests that, or says, or proclaims, doesn't just suggest it, he declares it, that all men are created equal, that equality is a basic value in American society, that that is a part of the American democracy, that that is, that is what drives the country, that is what we expect from a nation that got rid of a king and got rid of monarchy and created a society, a republic, that was supposed to be based upon the will of the people. The people were supposed to be sovereign. Now, as I said before, there was some question about who constituted the people, but once we settled the issue of slavery with the Civil War and passed the 14th Amendment, this is, you know, that this is the determination. This is the thing that makes plain that equality is supposed to be a value. Granger is really anticipating the 14th Amendment. He, he's, I think, was taking off from the Declaration, but he's anticipating the 14th Amendment that has equality or makes equality a goal in our society. So what we've been dealing with since that time period, from the very beginning, is some way to take a country that is as diverse as we are, that doesn't have a national religion, that doesn't have, or is not supposed to have, a national race. And we're saying, how do we bind ourselves together? And the Declaration, a notion of equality, a notion of the rule of law, a belief in a system of government is supposed to make us Americans. And the only way that that can be vindicated, the only way that that can work is if we recognize one another as equal citizens, no matter what our race, creed, or color. And it also doesn't work unless people participate. Unless people participate, all people who want to participate should be allowed to help choose our representatives, to choose our presidents, to choose our leaders. And the efforts to tamp down on that, to stop people from participating are not or un-American, I don't like, don't like to use that term that much, but it is antithetical to the system of, of a republic to suggest that certain people should not be allowed to participate and should not be able to vote because of their race. And what we've seen with voter suppression, other efforts to tamp down on the votes of people who uh, don't support a particular party, are in my effort, in my views, attacks upon our democracy. We're living in interesting times that can be good or bad. As I said, because I write about this as a scholar of the early American Republic, I pay attention to what is going on with our democracy a great deal. And I, it, it, means, it means a lot to me not just as a citizen, but as a scholar. I am not hopeless, however. I'm not, I, I'm not without hope, I should say. I am actually energized by and made optimistic by my students and by people and my, my daughter and my son, the people in their generations who are, generation who are, 
I would say galvanized, many of my students galvanized about this particular issue. They want to not only vote, but they, they, you know, they do canvassing. Some of them are thinking about running for office. I am made hopeful by young people who want to participate, who want the democracy to be strong. And it's not, you know, I, I, can, I don't have any choice but being optimistic. I think about the journey that my own family has made from people, ancestors who were enslaved in Texas to grandparents who worked their farm and sent my mother to college, my parents who sacrificed to send me and my brothers to school. And my own life has been one that suggests that progress is possible. I know progress is possible. We have a long way to go. And I'm optimistic because of the people that I see every day, the young people around me, that we're going to make it. It may seem we're in troubled times. It may seem hopeless to some, but I don't think we could afford to be that way. And I hope that everybody would hope that everybody sees that it is possible to have the kind of America that people have dreamed about and that the idea of America started in, starting in 1776 that gradually expanded to include everyone will continue to grow and flourish. So with that, I would like to take your questions. I'm unmuted, but my host has stopped my video. Oh dear. <laughs> so you don't, I guess, have to see me. Nobody will mind that. Uh, now they've started my video. Thank you, Bert. There you are. There I am. All right. All right. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, we've got plenty of time to take your questions. Uh, and so we're looking forward to getting them. Uh, and I see a couple, so I will get started. You, um, uh, Annette, you, you spoke tonight about uh, the fact, in a sense, that the popular resistance to white supremacy, what you saw coming out of George, George Floyd, gave you some gave you hope. At the same time, subsequent to that, we've continued to see civilian attacks on African Americans, civilian attacks on the LGBT community, civilian attacks on the Mexican American Asian community. Asian community. Uh, how how do we work our way out of that history? You know, I don't have the answer, but I think you, you start by recognizing or trying to understand where these things come from. The difficulty that we've had, as I said, from the beginning in settling on what it means to be an American, because we don't have as I said, a national religion, we don't have it, we're not supposed to have a national race. It's, it takes belief and belief in certain ideals. And, you know, I think if we look at where we've been and seeing the progress that we've made, it might give people some hope that we can go further. You know, I, I just think constantly talking about the need to respect one another to see the humanity and other people is vital. And that, that's, not a, that's not a great answer, but I don't know any other than that, is to, to raise your children to see the humanity and other people and to treat people as they would like to be treated themselves. And it's a simple rule, but and it's hard rule for people to follow, but I think it's essential. Um, well. In a sentence or two, and I think this is what we titled this the the, the presentation tonight. So, a fair question. Uh, but in a sentence or two, because it's probably a book. Uh, what <laughs> what precisely what is the paradox of American democracy? Well, 
paradox of American democracy that when we, when we talk about it is that we are a nation that was born in freedom, of people who were seeking freedom from a monarchy, but it was this country that had chattel slavery. And some of the people who were the most vociferous voices for breaking with Great Britain were slave owners. And it, it's the problem that we have now is we think about monuments and, and the names of things. How do you how do you fix this when you have what do you do when you have somebody who is, I mean, people have said, and I think most people who study this would agree that you know we wouldn't have had a country if George Washington had not been the general. I mean, he he wouldn't he not have been uh, head of the, the army and then the president. No, no one would rally, they wouldn't have rally around any other person <laughs> besides this individual. He's an indispensable man. Yet there's Mount Vernon and he had enslaved people at Mount Vernon and he sold people to the West Indies to almost certain death, you know, people who displeased him. I mean, he had the teeth of enslaved people in his mouth, you know? Uh, what do you do with that? Because <laughs> how do you, you can't just say, well, let's forget about this guy because then, you know, you don't have a country, we're here in this place. Jefferson, a similar story. So the paradox is slavery and freedom. Now, Ed Morgan, uh, the great historian said, well, in American slavery and American freedom, he says, it's not really a paradox because American slavery allowed whites to be free. It depended on the kind of freedom that they wanted, really sort of depended upon having an, an enslaved class of people because it allowed white men to be equal, whether they were rich or poor. But you have to think about the fact that these are human beings, you know, who were, who were held in slavery. And so I, th I think it is, if you think about it, and not in terms of the way the planters saw it, but if you think of it the way we think of it now, it's a paradox because how do you, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and yet, you know, you've got slaves. Okay, but we are in the 1700s with slavery, in the 1800s, early mid 1800s slavery, we have reconstruction, which uh, I've got to think of as a time of hope. And then, and then you have Jim Crow, and, but after, shoot, you know, I, I guess it, it is an evolution, but at some point, slavery is abolished. Yep. It's, at some point, our constitution couldn't be clear that all says men, but we know persons are created equal. Yep. And yet here we are with progress. With, you know, I, I don't like when people say there haven't been progress, there's clearly been progress but clearly still a lot of progress to be made. Yeah. It, 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 how, why? Why? Well, because slavery was an economic system, um, a labor system. It was a system of control. And it was a system, as it was practiced in the United States, that was, and in the West Indies and so forth, in British slavery and French slavery was, a system of, it was racial, it was racially based. So it created a racial hierarchy. And you can't, whether whether uh, Justice O'Connor, was it just 25 years, you may not need affirmative action anymore. It's like you can't do away with two or 300 years worth of a system that creates a culture, it taught, you know, we are, we still are a product of those times. I mean, it's a long time ago, but just as we, you know, we have rem the remnants of that world are still with us. And as we, you know, as you, as I'm sure you know, I mean, we really didn't get rid of Jim Crow legally till the mid sixties. Um, that's not that long ago in terms of history, that's a blink of an eye. It's gonna take time to get to where we want to get. But the point is to constantly have the struggle 
and to keep moving forward. Sometimes it will be fast. You know, it, it things happen more quickly than we thought. I mean, I was stunned that Barack Obama became president. And you may say, well, that's not a big deal, but it, it was a big deal. <laughs> it was a big deal to have an, an African-American as a president of the United States. I thought that would be maybe in my children's lifetime. I thought it would have to be a military guy. It would probably be a Republican, somebody super conservative. You know, I had all these things. If this were to happen, this is how it would be. And yet, Barack Obama, he's, the, he's someone with a, you know, a not a, a not a, uh, a usual name um, and a, a usual presentation, and he became president. So then you have that, but we've had in the post-Obama year, talk about a backlash, in the post-Obama time period, we've seen stuff that I just, people are saying things that I never thought I'd hear people say, <laughs> feel free to say. And because I thought, all right, that's been put away. And I know it's those feelings are there under underneath the surface, but you know, we all, out of being polite and our understanding where we are, we don't say those things. And now it's like no holes barred. So uh, we go forward and we go back. And I, I think that's probably the way it's going to be until, well, I don't know what, but I, I have to be hopeful that the forward progress will out be, you know, outweigh the the backlash. Thanks. Or outrun the backlash. So this is how it always goes. The question starts slowly and then all of a sudden we get more than we'll have time for. Uh, here's a question. Uh, thank you very much for this illuminating talk on the challenge of democracy in America. In your talk, you characterize aspects of the issue of race as difficult subject to talk about. Why is this difficult and difficult for who? I think it's difficult because it's very hard for people to be honest about their feelings. I mean, I found this is, you know, in, in my experience, people are um, find it difficult to be honest about their feelings. They, they believe that if they say the wrong thing, um, they will offend people that they might care about. And I'm talking about discussions among people who are, who know each other and who are friendly. Um, there's just, it's a, it's a touchy subject because people don't want to be labeled. Um, and sometimes people, people are in fact hurt by the things that uh, others say to them uh, when they're trying to be honest about these matters. We just, we don't know each other as well, that, you know, that well. And it's kind of hard to talk across the differences. You know, and when it, it can happen and it does happen in many instances, but it's a, uh, it's, it's fraught subject. Yeah. Uh, there are jurisdictions that are discussing providing re reparations. Do you think these discussions will resolve the paradox of American democracy or at least be a step in the right direction? Are they linked to the notion of greater justice or are they will they be helpful or cause a backlash? Well, it would probably cause a backlash too, but there's a moral at there's a moral aspect to this. Um I personally thought, because people ask me about reparations all the time, and you know, as a, it's hard for me to think of it otherwise, other than as a lawyer and thinking about standing and all the various questions, the procedural questions that go along with all that. But it occurs to me that a way to start might be with things that happen in the 20th century that for which there are people who are still alive. <laughs> who suffered those kinds of things, uh, you know, housing discrimination, things that were against the, that the government was involved in things that were, that officials were involved in things that were against the, the 14th amendment and maybe work your way back from there. I mean, I know most people think about reparations just in terms of slavery, but there's so many things that happened. People, you know, had their property taken from them as they were run out of towns, you know, and 
those are things that can be documented. They tried it with Tulsa and it didn't work there, but that isn't, there are lots of Tulsa's. There, you know, there are ways maybe of reformulating that kind of litigation. I think if done like that, it might be a way of working our way back. <laughs> if people, you know, if slavery is, is the ultimate goal, some reparations for that. I think starting this might get the ball rolling, but there's no question that it will cause a backlash. Um, but but there's a moral there's a moral imperative I think there and but I would like to see it start with modern violations of rights that haven't been redressed. Here's here's a here's a thoughtful question. What is the correct narrative for us to embrace on United States racial history, and how would that? help bring us together as a people when it is such a painful story? Uh, how, how can we help heal the nation from its original sin? Well, there can't be one narrative. Um, I think it's recognizing that there are different narratives, but emphasizing the way that some aspects of those narratives come together. Um, I think, thinking about Jefferson, for example, um, there's a narrative of America that that has centered on him and the founders in general, um, the the so-called the the male the men who are designated as founders. What I've tried to do in my work is to complete the story, <laughs> expand the story, complicate the story by peopling others in Jefferson's life by repeopling his existence, bringing in people, enslaved people who were around him, other family members, all those kinds of people who were part of his life. And so the narrative has to be, I guess it's just another elaborate way of saying, the narrative has to be an inclusive narrative. It has to be one that takes and respects other people because you don't really know Jefferson if you don't know about slavery, about the institution of slavery and the way he and Washington and other people lived with African-American people around them and sold African-American people, um, lived with African-American people. So the narrative has to include everybody. You know, it has to be as full a story as possible. And that's why you have, not, and not any one historian can do all of that. <laughs> so that's why you have to have a body of scholarship that works on different aspects and puts the piece together. Because I'm convinced that one of the reasons I wrote the Hemings as the Monticello is that I thought if I could create portraits of individual people, so that Sally Hemings and James Hemings and Robert Hemings and Elizabeth and all of them live as individual people and not just as an enslaved woman, an enslaved man or whatever, people who were mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and friends and aunts, that readers could have a stake in them and see back to what I said before about seeing people's humanity and say, you know, they're in a completely different situation than I'm in, but I, there's something about what they're doing, something about their reaction that I can relate to, that I understand, because that's a person and I'm a person. And before, when they were just like Jefferson servants <laughs> or the slave boy that they Jefferson took with them to France, it's hard to do that. But if you know James and you know his, I you know, give anecdotes about him and you create a story for him, I think that's a way for people to start thinking about enslaved people as people and think about African-American people as people uh, to, to be reminded of that because it's so easy, I think, for people to shut off from that realization and say that they're, that they're so different Whites are so different, Blacks are so different, they don't have any connection to me. Um, it's, it's about making people know one another. And 
I it, it may be naive, but I think it changes the stakes and it changes the, the narrative. The narrative has to be inclusive and, and, and done in a way or that always takes into account the humanity of the people who are part of the story. Great. Uh, interesting, quite good question now. As a white woman from the South, I know I have the opportunity to, talk, to walk in communities and talk in ways where people may listen that might not listen otherwise. Now that I've moved past my anger over the past few years, I wanna be able to reach out and have good conversations. Do you have any recommendations on ways to really talk to the people who are so convinced that their Fox News uh, station is real and get, oh, them wow. to listen, and get them to listen? White woman from the South. Well, that's a tough one um, because we all have relatives that are friends and people that it's hard to, to talk to. You know, be as respectful as you can, I don't think, as you can, <laughs> respectful as you can, I don't think you get anywhere by ridiculing people or making or, or being condescending to people. If you try to figure out what's bothering this person, you know, what, you know, what is driving them? What is, you know, what is making them think these things or feel this particular way? Uh, sometimes it's it's you can get around that. I, I would have to know the person <laughs> to be able to give a definitive answer. But I think respect, approaching people with a sense of respect, even if you even if you think that what they're saying is way out there, um, if people know that you are sincere or sense that you are you sincerely want to connect to them about something, it's been my experience. That, now there's some people who are hopeless. You know, that they're just not going to do it. But for people, I think most people respond to being spoken to in a respectful way, in a way that conveys interest in what what they're thinking and why they're thinking that that's perhaps a way to get around the wall um, that can, that people can put up. Um, but it's a tough thing if you're someone who's listening to things you know, 24 seven, um, it's a very, very powerful hold on people. But I think respect and interest are things that people, genuine interest are things that people, I, in my experience, that people respond to. Yeah, and this sort of segues a, a little. Some of the people who oppose the ideas and history contained under the umbrella of critical race theory being taught or even mentioned in a K through 12 school say that these ideas and history will make white children feel bad about themselves. How do you respond to that? Well, they should feel bad that people in the past did these kinds of things. But the past, you, you should understand and you should teach children that the past, as they say, is a foreign country. I mean, they don't live in the past. They live in a present. And if you, I think a lot of things you could do with kids, one of the things you can do with kids is to talk about a notion of progress. You know, people used to believe those things. There are all kinds of things, whether it's about, you know, folk medicine, things that, things that people believed in the past that don't actually work. Uh, they used to believe that, but now we believe something else. I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that, I think there's a way to present things to children that reminds them that they're not those people. And history and what you hope for, and, and this is appropriate for kids, we all know that things don't always go to progress, but for kids, you can say, you can point to the fact that we have made progress. And just because those people did that doesn't mean that they're, they're the same. I, I, I know that there's been a controversy over a book about Ruby Bridges and uh, a child's book about Ruby Bridges because, and the parents said, because this will make them feel bad because there are pictures of white people outside of Ruby Bridges' school yelling at her. And in fact, there were white people outside of the school yelling at Ruby Bridges. But there was also a white woman teacher who worked with Ruby Bridges as a little girl. So it's like, why would 
why the kids would automatically identify with Ruby Bridges and they would identify with a teacher. Those two people, why, you know, why would you think that they would see themselves in the people outside yelling? And so what it really seems to be is that they don't want those people who are outside yelling to be painted in a bad light, you know, because the kids would automatically know who they were connected to. And it's not about race. It's, a, it's the feeling that kids are, have a very strong sense of fairness of how unfair it would be for adults to be carrying on like that. So what, what is wrong with her, her, them identifying with the people who are the victims there? I mean, it's, it's in insisting on sort of a racial, you know, way of weighing what is right or wrong, when in fact the answer is, hey, I'm like Ruby and the teacher who's helping her, not those people out there. So I, I mean, long answer to just say, I think that's not a good, that's not a good argument <laughs> because people know that the world changes and there are plenty of things that my, you know, our ancestors, my ancestors did, whether it's male, female relations, all kinds of stuff that you'd say, boy, I'm glad we're not doing that anymore. And just realized they just, they didn't know better, but now we do and we're going forward. All right. Uh, here's one. This very point has been vexing me for several years. What is the asterisk next to famous slave owners uh, like Jefferson uh, uh, to famous authors like Susan Twain need to look like if we decide not to vanquish those like them who are embedded in this paradox? Now start to the beginning. What, what, what does what look like? What, what, is the, what is the asterisk mm -hmm. look like? if we're not going to just vanquish these folks, uh, you know, uh, we're, we, we shouldn't maybe eliminate them from our history, but what is the appropriate oh, historical oh. approach? You just, I think the historical approach is you tell the good and the bad, yeah. you know, you tell the good and the bad and different people will weigh things differently. You know, I mean, some people might say, you know, I just, that's it for me, I can't. But that, as I said before, that when I was talking about Washington, you have to deal with the fact that this country was started by um, about some by some people who, you know, lived in a way that we wouldn't live, that we think is wrong, but they helped start the country. And it's, it's a lesson, I think, in in life, <laughs> because there's good and there's bad, and you have to weigh those things. And as I said, some people will weigh the balance differently. But you have to do both things. We can't go back to. I, I don't think we should go back to Washington is God, you know, Jefferson is God. Nor do I think it should be Washington is the devil, then Jefferson is the devil, because these were people, and they did great things and they did terrible things. And you just have to deal with that. I mean, life, it, that sort of duality is there, is present in so much of life. And it, what it, I suppose it suggests that hero worship, a, a particular type of hero worship isn't appropriate. <laughs> you can't pretend that the person didn't do these things or that you don't care about that. You have to take account of that, but I also, I you know, demonizing. I mean, well, maybe there, maybe there may be some people that are just way out, out, you know, out who haven't done enough to, who didn't start the country. Um, you might be able to say, well, they're not worth it, but you know, I don't think that that counts for the people who started the United States. Um comment and i think this might have come off of like one of the comments on the you know those little book uh, blurbs they put comment on juneteenth is a love story about texas your comment my comment a love story about texas yeah is that what it is uh sort of yeah i would say that you know i know that surprises people people say what can you love about texas <laughs> well i, I 
I explain in the book what I love about Texas is that's where I lived with my mother and my father and my brothers and people who loved me. And I learned about love and family in that place. And that place is as much mine as it is the people who make Texas difficult. You know, I, I don't think I have to concede the place to them when my family has lived there for generations and generations. I could trace my mother's on my mother's side back to the 1820s in Texas and my father's side, the 1850s. Uh, through difficult times, people who had a lot of hope. I mean, one of the most poignant things that I found when I was working on, on Juneteenth was um, a voter list with my great, great grandfather on it in 1867. Hmm. A person who had you know, started life being treated as a chattel. Now, after the end of slavery, he wanted to participate in um, choosing leaders, the people who would be the leaders. And, you know, I know what's going to happen, you know, in 1870, after the end of Reconstruction, all of this comes crashing down. And it wouldn't be until the 1960s that Black people would have the legal right. I mean, it had the, they had the right before, but there would be assurances with the Voting Rights Act uh, of, uh, of uh, the franchise for Black people. And, you know, I participated in this process by integrating the schools in my in my hometown when I was six years old. Um, so, you know, I've seen people who stay, who chose to stay there and struggle and live with their families. I consider it to be ours as well. And so that's, that's how I feel about it. Okay, I just have time for a couple more questions. Um, let's take this one. Given how our society has changed since the country was founded, what argument could be made for the legal system to maintain an originalist posture? Hope that's not too rhetorical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, not many, I would say. Um, because first place, I mean, they didn't, I mean, originalist, originalism has all kinds of issues, and that, not the least of which is that, you know, three years after the thing is ratified, they're asking each other, what do we mean by that? You know, within the cabinet, in Washington's cabinet, and they're doing all kinds of things to, to try to figure out what actually they meant. Um, I think it's, in, it's inappropriate to sort of want to go back to a time period when the culture did not recognize the humanity of African-American people, uh, the equality of women. You know, the, the Constitution has been transformed and our, and our culture has been transformed. And so, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see an argument that says, well, women should have the rights that women had in 1790 and when coverture was the order of the day. Or people believed in witches, you know, I mean, it's just, I mean, I'm just referring to one of the quotes, one of the uh, footnotes in the, in the Dobbs opinion. Um, I'm not for it. I'm not an originalist. <laughs> so uh, one more question. And then for those whose questions haven't been answered, in some, uh, in some cases, we you put in your name and so we can follow up with you. Some put in anonymously. If your question hasn't been answered, and you would like us to get back to you, if you'd like to put it back in um, without, with your name, uh, uh, Professor Gordon Reed, would you be willing if we sent you a four or five, six more questions to- Oh, sure. Sure, so we can do that for those whose questions we didn't get to tonight. Um, one last question. Uh, one of the goals of our program is to have participants get a deeper understanding of everybody's personal role in the constant evolution of our democracy. Um, could you just touch for a moment on your personal story that started with being the child that desegregated your first grade class in Texas until uh, recently having an elementary school named after you in the district uh, in your honor? In the same well, yes, my parents uh, de decided they had a freedom of choice plan 
And that was a way of defying Brown. This is 10 years after Brown versus Board of Education. White people were supposed to pick white schools and black people were supposed to pick black, the black school in our town. And my parents picked a white school. And it was a big deal. Um, they didn't make a big deal about it. I wasn't escorted into the school, but um, they treated it like it was a normal day. And uh, But it wasn't. It was a tough, a you know, sort of a tense time. My teacher, Mrs. Daughtry, was wonderful. Um, I was somewhat on display, however, because people would come and stand and look in the, you know, administrators to come to see what this miraculous thing, a uh, black student in the, in the class with white kids. Um, and, you know, three years later, the Supreme Court struck down the freedom of choice plans. And then everybody in the town had to move around. And I was already at Anderson and in place, including my brothers who had been at the black school. They had to go to, they, they changed schools as well. Fast forward to a few years ago, they asked me if I would be willing to let them name a school after me. And I said, no. And, uh, cause I didn't think you should name things for people who were still alive. Uh, and, but my husband, said my parent my parents who are no longer living my husband said you know your parents would be over the moon about this and some of their friends are still alive you really should do this and so i said yes and this past year i mean this is two years ago they built the school and this past october i went down for the ceremony opening it annette gordon reed elementary school and it's a surreal experience but it's you know it's a a show of progress right there. I mean, the, the, the town isn't perfect. Everything is not great, but that would never have happened. <laughs> I mean, the, the black school was named for Booker T. Washington. And it, so black schools were named for people like that, you know, um, Frederick Douglass, you know, Phyllis Wheatley, it's things like that. But this would not have happened. And um, they would have been, my parents would have been very happy. So I think that that's, that, that's my contribution. You know, I don't, I didn't think that I was doing anything as a sixth grader, as a first grade, a six year old, I was just going to school. But in looking back on it, uh, I guess I was. Okay, fantastic. Um, before we say good evening to you, uh, Professor Gordon Reed, I do want to remind everybody put on your calendar, please, uh, April 27th, 5 30, uh, Stephen Levitsky, the author of How Democracies Die. Uh, probably will have some good insight for us, uh, comparative uh, international democracies. Um, uh, again, also, if you do want your questions answered, just uh, we have certain names for questions that weren't, but if you're we're anonymous and you want to get it, uh, we will uh, get that information to uh, the professor, and she's been gracious enough to say that she'll get us answers back. Um, Annette Gordon-Reed, thank you for joining us this evening. Wonderful wonderful conversation. Uh, glad to add you to all the great folks we've had over the years and will continue to have. Uh, and ha have a great evening. Thank you. You too. What a great program. Thank you.